everyone and welcome back to yet another video. This video is going to be all about the classic books that are actually worth your time, in particular the longer classic books that I think you should absolutely read. Now I did a video about short classics that won't take you forever to read and I was thinking about the long books that I really do think are worth the time it'll take you to read them. And these books, I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 plus. Um, I'll explain that in a little bit, but yeah, so I have 13 plus books. This is pretty much, all of these books are some of my all-time favorite classics, so if I ever do an all-time favorite classics video, which I was thinking about doing in the near future, a lot of these books are going to be on that list. These are some of my favorite books ever, and of course that I think are worth your time and worth the reading experience that you put into picking up a bigger book. Some of these aren't super long. I think the shortest one is about 300, the upper 300s, 380 or 90. I tried to do around 400 pages or more because those are more of the commitment books, but I do really think that these are worth your time. So anyway, without further babbling on, I'm just going to tell you guys which classics I think are absolutely worth your time to read. The first one is Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. If you want to read any Charles Dickens book, you have never read a single Charles Dickens book in your whole life, you don't want to read any Charles Dickens, but you have a slight interest, I would say pick up Great Expectations. It is, I think, Dickens at his best. I haven't read much of his later works. I have read a lot of his earlier works. To be completely honest, I don't think they're worth your time. I do think Great Expectations is absolutely worth your time. The story itself is so incredible, and I think what would be interesting is if I read the first sentence or paragraph to pique your interest. I feel like giving you a taste of the beginning is quite fun and interesting, at least I think so. Chapter 1. My father's name being Pirup, and my Christian name Philip. My infant tongue could make of both names nothing longer or more explicit than Pip. So I called myself Pip and came to be called Pip. And so that is the first paragraph. Something else that I love that is also in the beginning is this one scene where Dickens describes the moisture and the fog and the mist on the windows as a gall a goblin, a goblin, <laughs> a go a goblin. Why can't I say that? A goblin. Um, was sleeping on the window during the night and left moisture from its breathing and then of course it went away by the time that you see the moisture in the morning. And I love how he can take such an everyday thing like moisture on a window and make it so fantastical and magical and that's just what he does throughout this whole book. The imagery is incredible, the setting is incredible, I just, I love it so much, it'll keep you on the edge of your seat, it'll keep you engaged, so when I was reading this book I just didn't want it to end, and I think that that's the best thing to happen when you're reading a longer book, especially a classic. So, Great Expectations, please, please read it, or consider reading it. The next book I have is Emma by Jane Austen. Of course, any book by Jane Austen I highly recommend. My two favorites are Pride and Prejudice and Emma, and I do definitely think that Jane Austen is worth your time. Everyone loves her for a reason. Her writing is just so singular to her. You will not read anything like Jane Austen. Of course, there are other romances that have the tropes that she kind of coined and invented, but it's best in her books. Emma is one of those books that will make you laugh the whole entire time, but it'll also intrigue you into how the bad decisions that Emma makes, you want to know how they turn out. And so again, it'll keep you on the edge of your seat and you'll want to know what will happen to the characters and their relationships. Okay, this is one of my favorite beginnings ever, and it says chapter one, Emma Woodhouse. Handsome, clever, and rich, with a comfortable home and happy disposition, seemed to unite some of the best blessings of existence, and had lived nearly 21 years in the world, with very little to distress or vex her." I love that opening because I think it she just brings us right into understanding the character of Emma, and of course we follow Emma as she tries to matchmake with all of the people in her society, and how 
that's not always the best idea and I just adore it so absolutely worth your time if you are having a hard time reading Jane Austen I highly recommend watching one of the movie adaptations before reading it because that's what I do a lot and it helps very much the next book is kind of a contradictory one because I do and don't think this book is worth your time and that is Les Miserables by Victor Hugo I love the story of Les Mis. I love the musical, I love everything about the story of Les Mis, but there were some parts when I was reading it that I was wondering, is this entirely necessary or it was kind of dragging and I felt like, is this really worth my time reading? To the point where I was even considering skipping through some pages. I didn't, I stuck through the Battle of Waterloo and the scenes where Victor Hugo goes into great detail about the sewage systems of Paris. Now, I think that there are so many aspects of this book and so many scenes and characters and chapters that are 110 billion percent worth your time reading. The writing is exquisite, the characters are just so vivid and full of life and you sympathize with them and you care for them so deeply. But then there are other scenes where I'm just thinking to myself, wow, I am tired. <laughs> and you feel the amount of pages. See, I do and don't want to say this. I'm going to say it. Would you consider reading an abridged version? I have thought about this quite a lot. If I ever reread Les Mis, I might consider rereading it in an abridged version to see if I feel differently, if I will enjoy an abridged version more than the full story. As a classics lover, I always recommend reading a full story. I don't usually recommend reading an abridged version just because you want the true original essence of the writer's intention. And I wanted to read what Victor Hugo intended people to read. But again, as a modern reader, if you are reading for enjoyment and you are either newer to classics or this is quite, um, quite a feat for you, maybe consider reading an abridged version? I don't know. That's completely personal. Don't go by my judgment. Um, but I would say read the whole thing if you really want to. If you're having a hard time getting through it, there are amazing movie adaptations. Yes and no. I was, I was considering not putting it on this list, but I do really think that it's worth your time because I adore the story so much. It's just the... is it worth your time? Yes and no. In 1815, Charles Francois Bienvenu Muriel was Bishop of Digny. He was an old man of about 75. He had been Bishop of Digny since 1806. I don't know if I'm pronouncing those names correctly. If only for the sake of being accurate in every particular, although this circumstance in no way impinges on the basic substance of what we are about to relate, it may be worth mentioning here the rumors and gossip circulating about him at the time of his arrival in the diocese, diocese, true or false, what is said about men often figures as large in their lives and above all in the fate that befalls them as what they do. So we of course have Victor Hugo's very moralistic writing with these beliefs, systems, and religion plays a really big role, and what is moral and ethical and just and right, and it's beautifully done. So that is Les Miserables by Victor Hugo. Then the next book I have is Tess of the Durbervilles by Thomas Hardy. Any book by Thomas Hardy, Tess is my personal favorite. This book will rip your heart out in the best way possible. So we are following Tess who is in a really, really difficult circumstance. She goes through something very traumatic and it's basically just this really harrowing story of everything that Tess goes through. And throughout the whole entire story, you are going to be so angry but in the best way where it's really satisfying and you just want to know what is going to happen. You just want to know if everything's going to be all right. And you care so deeply for Tess and her journey and everything that it will keep you on the edge of your seat the whole time. Again, never wanted this book to end. Never have I ever wanted to throw a book out of a window so desperately, but also not throw it out of the window so desperately because I wanted to keep reading it. So it begins by saying, On an evening in the latter part of May, a middle-aged man was walking homeward from Shaston to the village of Marlotte in the adjoining vale of Blakemore or Blackmore. 
The pair of legs that carried him were rickety, and there was a base in his gait which inclined him somewhat to the left of a straight line. He occasionally gave a smart nod, as if in confirmation of some opinion, though he was not thinking of anything in particular. An empty egg basket was slung upon his arm. The nap of his hat was ruffled, a patch being quite worn away at its brim where his thumb came in taking it off. Presently, he was met by an elderly parson astride on a gray mare, who, as he rode, hummed a wandering tune. I think that that's such a beautiful way to introduce the reader. I love when we get an introduction as introducing a scene, introducing a person. It just, like, takes you right into the book. And I love Tess. It'll break your heart, but in the best way possible. Absolutely worth your time. Then the next book is the book that got me into reading classics. I can't recommend it enough. And that is Jane Eyre by, of course, Charlotte Bronte. I love all the Bronte sisters. I also think Wuthering Heights is worth your time. It's not on this list because I wanted to highlight Jane Eyre in particular. Jane Eyre, I think, is one of those books that is perfect for anyone that is looking for a classic that, again, won't feel like it'll take you a lot of time because it's written in first person point of view and I think that that, especially in a classic, is really helpful to get you through a story because it's like reading a diary. It's kind of like you finding a diary that you weren't supposed to find and sort of having an insight into this one person's life and story. And again, we have a really gloomy, um, dark setting, a very gothic story that has a lot of mystery and intrigue and it'll keep you on the edge of your seat and you'll want to know what's going on. You'll want to know who has good intentions, who doesn't, what will happen, um, will everything be all right. Chapter one starts by saying, there was no possibility of taking a walk that day. We had been wandering indeed in the leafless shrubbery an hour in the morning, but since dinner, Mrs. Reed, when there was no company, dined early. The cold winter wind had brought with it clouds so somber and a rain so penetrating that further outdoor exercise was now out of the question. I was glad of it. I never liked long walks, especially on chilly afternoons. Dreadful to me was the coming home in the raw twilight with nipped fingers and toes and a heart saddened by the chidings of Bessie the nurse and humbled by the consciousness of my physical inferiority to Elizabeth, John, and Georgiana Reed. So we have young Jane, and we follow Jane in her coming of age and leaving of her aunt's house. She is an orphan, and it's really about her trying to find her way. The writing is exquisite, the story is beautiful, can't recommend it enough, absolutely worth your time. The next book is compared quite a lot to Jane Eyre, although it is quite different, and that is Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier. We do have some similar themes going on in Jane Eyre and Rebecca. Daphne du Maurier is known for writing quite suspenseful, thrilling stories that aren't really jump out scary, but are they leave you kind of feeling uneasy, I guess, and intrigued, and you want to know the truth. Something is fishy here, and you want to know why. So I think that that's really wonderful when it'll keep you engaged, keep you intrigued, and of course, say it with me, it's worth your time. It's not very long at all either. Uh, I think it's about, yeah, almost 400 pages, a little over 400 pages. This is the beautiful 80th anniversary edition from Virago, and I love this edition so much. It is just gorgeous. Rebecca is probably my favorite of Daphne du Maurier books. Um, she is just such an incredible writer. I would like to read more from her. I have read Rebecca and My Cousin Rachel. I really want to read Jamaica Inn as well, and I just, I just love this. Oh, look at her. She's so beautiful, oh my goodness. Rebecca starts by saying, Last night I dreamt I went to Manderley again. Again, we are also in first person, which I do feel like is really uh, helpful when you are newer to classics or you... I feel like first person point of view creates a, a faster reading experience. Um, also, this is in the point of view of our main character who we actually never know their name, which I think is really intriguing as well, and it makes the character of Rebecca even more prominent and makes her even more powerful. So anyway, it says, Last night I dreamt I went to Manderley again. It seemed to me I stood by the iron gate leading to the drive, and for a while I could not enter. For the way was barred to me. There was a padlock and a chain upon the gate. 
I called in my dream to the lodge keeper and had no answer, and peering closer through the rusted spokes of the gate, I saw that the lodge was inhabited. The imagery in this book, the setting of the book, the setting of Manderley is just you will completely get lost in it and you will feel like you are really there with the characters. I cannot recommend this book enough. It is amazing and it's also perfect, I think, for the autumnal season. So, good time to pick it up. The next book I have is another favorite, of course, and that is Little Women by Louise May Alcott. This is quite a hefty book. This is the Puffin in Bloom edition, and this has Little Women and Good Wives, which is why it is a bit bigger. I highly recommend reading both Little Women and Good Wives, because if you just read the first volume, Little Women, you won't get the full story. You want to read Good Wives as well. Little Women is quite, quite long when you have both stories, although the text in this edition is quite large. Um, this is about 770 pages-ish, which is quite long, but absolutely worth your time. I know this is one of those books where it's kind of love it or hate it. I feel like some people think it's a bit too preachy, which I understand because it can be a little preachy. But that's, I think, what I love about this story. It feels like... it does feel of its time, I will say that, but it was also progressive for its time as well, because this is one of the first books that we got. It is an American classic um, by Louisa May Alcott, who was in this environment of a lot of male writers at the time that she was writing, and not a lot of stories especially in America, were written about the every woman or every girl's growing up or coming of age. And she really shed light on that and what women went through and the woman's side of the time that she was writing in. So I really appreciate that as its historical basis, but it's also just it's about these four sisters, these four March sisters, and their, just their lives and what happens to them and their relationships and their relationships with each other and them becoming wives or if some of them do or don't become wives and their relationship with their family. It's just, and their relationship with their neighbor, Lori. Read it for Lori. Oh my gosh, I, I love Lori so much. And of course, we have the amazing adaptations. I love the adaptation from the 90s. I also love the recent adaptation. It's just so good. And this story, I think, is such a comfort. It is perfect for the Christmas season because it opens by saying, Christmas won't be Christmas without any presents, grumbled Joe, lying on the rug. It's so dreadful to be poor, sighed Meg, looking down at her old dress. I don't think it's fair for some girls to have lots of pretty things, and other girls nothing at all, added little Amy with an injured sniff. We've got father and mother and each other anyhow, said Beth, contentedly from her corner. The four young faces on which the firelight shone brightened at the cheerful words, but darkened again, as Joe said sadly, We haven't got father, and shall not have him for a long time. She didn't say, perhaps never, but each silently added it, thinking of father far away where the fighting was. So I love how in the beginning we are introduced right away to all four March sisters and their opinions on their current social standing, their wealth, um, and that all relates to their stories from there on further. It's not only perfect for Christmas, I know I said it's perfect for Christmas because it opens on Christmas, but you follow them, of course, throughout many years and many seasons of their lives, and it's just one of those books that I think you completely connect to the characters and you really feel for them, and they almost become like your own family, because it just feels like you are the fifth March sister, or brother or anyone. So yes, love Little Women. The next book has been a favorite of mine for many years and I actually first watched the movie growing up. I loved this movie and then later on in my teens I read the book for the first time and I adored it. And that is The Princess Bride by William Goldman. Now The Princess Bride I would consider, a, it is a classic but it's also, I don't know, would it be considered a modern classic? I'm not sure, that's up to you. I consider it a classic. And it is a bit long, it is over 400 pages, but 450 pages, and this is a fantasy story. I'm not a huge fantasy reader, but there is something about this story, probably because I grew up watching and reading it, that I 
love it so much. We follow Wesley and Buttercup. It is about star-crossed lovers and good and evil and these lands being at war with one another and kings and giants and witches and it is just it's just a fantastic story. I'll read you the back because I think it's hilarious. Yeah, so the back says, A tale of true love and high adventures, pirates, princesses, giants, miracles, fencing, and a frightening assortment of wild beasts. The Princess Bride is a modern storytelling classic. As Florin and Gilder teeter on the verge of war, the reluctant Princess Buttercup is devastated by the loss of her true love, kidnapped by a mercenary and his henchmen, rescued by a pirate, forced to marry Prince Humperdinck, and rescued once again by the very crew who absconded with her in the first place. In the course of this dazzling adventure, she'll meet Vizzini, the criminal philosopher who will do anything for a bag of gold, Fezzik, the gentle giant, Inigo, the Spaniard who steals thirsts for revenge, and Count Rugen, the evil mastermind behind it all. Foiling all their plans and jumping into their stories is Wesley, Princess Buttercup's one true love and a very good friend of a dangerous pirate. It is just one of my favorite stories, and I haven't reread it in a while, and I, now I really want to, or watch the movie. It is just nonsense, but in the best way. It's so quirky and weird, but I love it so much, and I highly recommend it. If you like fantasy, or if you are looking for one of those very classic fable adventure stories, this really is quite like that, or it is that, so love The Princess Bride. The next book isn't very long, but I definitely think it's worth your time, and that is A Farewell to Arms by Ernest Hemingway. If you are interested in reading Hemingway and you never have, I highly recommend everyone start their Hemingway journey with A Farewell to Arms because it is my absolute favorite. It is one of my absolute favorite books ever, but I do really think it's Hemingway's best, and it's just this is how I started my love for Hemingway, and I can't recommend it enough. It's absolutely worth the time that it takes to read it. It's not very long, about 3.30, and the ending will break your heart, but it's so beautiful. It is your typical Hemingway, but it has something else that his other books don't have for me that is just exceptional and that I think is really what makes it my favorite and makes it his best. We are following a our main character. He's an American soldier driving the ambulance in, during the war in Italy. And it's also inspired by Hemingway's own experience as an ambulance driver in Italy during the war. It's about him um, falling in love and him dealing with the war. It's just so good and it's quite bland but humorous at times. And it's, it's bland in a Hemingway way, where you love the fact that he is just so to the point and succinct. And I just realized that I didn't read the beginning of Princess Bride. <laughs> my head is not attached to today. Today. I can't speak. Oh my goodness. Oh, this is one of my favorite opening lines ever. This is my favorite book in all the world, though I have never read it. How is such a thing possible? I'll do my best to explain. As a child, I had simply no interest in books. I hated reading. I was very bad at it. And besides, how could you take the time to read when there were games that shrieked for playing? Basketball, baseball, marbles, I could never get enough. I wasn't even good at them. But give me a football in an empty playground and I could invent last second triumphs that would bring tears to your eyes. School was torture. Miss Riginski, who was my teacher for the third through fifth grades, would have meeting after meeting with my mother. I don't feel Billy is perhaps extending himself quite as much as he might. Or, when we test him, Billy does really exceptionally well considering his class standing. Or most often, I don't know, Mrs. Goldman, what are we going to do with Billy? What are we going to do with Billy? That was the phrase that haunted me through those first ten years. I pretended not to care, but secretly I was petrified. Everyone and everything was passing me by. I had no real friends, no single person who shared an equal interest in all games. I seemed busy, 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 but I suppose, if pressed, I might have admitted that, for all my frenzy, I was very much alone. I love it so much. So we start out with this character of 
Billy Goldman, who is the writer, and his connection with the story of The Princess Bride. So it then transitions into The Princess Bride. But it is, it's just, it's so good, it's so good. Anyway, back to A Farewell to Arms. I love it so much. Please start your Hemingway journey with it. I will read you the beginning as well. In the late summer of that year, we lived in a house in a village that looked across the river and the plain to the mountains. In the bed of the river, there were pebbles and boulders, dry and white in the sun, and the water was clear and swiftly moving and blue in the channels. Troops went by the house and down the road, and the dust they raised powdered the leaves of the trees. The trunks of the trees, too, were dusted, and the leaves fell early that year, and we saw the troops marching along the road, and the dust rising, and leaves stirred by the breeze, falling, and the soldiers marching, and afterward the road bare and white except for the leaves. <laughs> I love Hemingway's writing, because it's just like, this is how it was, and this is, and just no sugarcoating anything, this is what it looked like, this is, you know, the air was like this, the trees were like this, and there's no floweriness to it, it's just the truth. And I love that Hemingway always wanted to be a very truthful writer, and that's exactly what he is. And I love his writing. I love this story. Absolutely worth your time. Please read it. We are getting close to the top here. The next book, or books, because I said 13 plus, is because I'm recommending a whole series of books, although I highly recommend you read the first one, and then you'll hopefully want to read the rest of them. That is Anne of Green Gables by Ella Montgomery. Now I have the whole box set here. I read the box set, I think, in the span of a month, and you don't have to read it in the span of a month, of course, because you can do whatever you want. I think that the whole series is worth your time because we follow Anne Shirley, who is an orphan. This is a Canadian classic, and we follow her and her life journey throughout the whole series. But the first book is really about her just being such a spirited feisty young girl and her relationship with this brother and sister that take her in and the friends that she makes, her relationships later on and how everything in her life develops. She coins the phrase of a kindred spirit and to me she really feels like my own kindred spirit. I love Anne. I love following her story. She is one of those fictional characters that I feel the closest to, like she's almost a friend to me. And when I was reading these books, it really felt like I was just sitting down with a friend and hearing her talk and talk and talk and talk because if you know anything about Anne Shirley, she is quite chatty and she doesn't always make very good decisions. So again, it'll keep you interested. I, I think I was always kept interested because I wanted to know what Anne would do next or what she would say next or who she would end up with or how her relationships would develop and just I love this series so much. Absolutely worth your time. All eight books but especially just start out with Anne of Green Gables. It is so good and there is the amazing TV adaptation Anne with an E that I love so much. There's also the original adaptation of Anne of Green Gables with Meg Fellows that I've never seen before but I desperately want to. So that is Anne of Green Gables. I will just put it on my shelf. This is one of my favorite books absolutely ever, and I actually have never physically read it. I've only listened to the audiobook because I was quite scared of the sheer size of it, and so I thought, let me listen to it. I listened to it my senior year of university, and I was listening to it as I worked on a lot of my final art projects because I went to school for illustration, so all of my work was painting, or I actually listened to this a lot while I was embroidering a book cover for Anne of Green Gables for my thesis project. Anyway, that doesn't really matter. The book is Don Quixote by Miguel de Cervantes, and I love Don Quixote so much. I was so nervous about it because I thought that the writing was going to be really difficult to get into, and I thought if I listen to it, it won't be so bad. And it wasn't, and it was really captivating, and I was hooked from page one, and I love Don Quixote so much him as a character. I love Sancho Panza, his sidekick, and just the adventures that they go on. It is one of those stories that is so, 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 so worth your time. It'll make you laugh, it'll make you cry, it'll make you 
smile. It'll just bring so much joy and light into your day whenever you read it, and I absolutely think it's worth the page count. Let's see how many pages it is. Almost 1,000 pages around there, but really, really, really worth your time. I would highly recommend listening to the audiobook because I loved it. I also just realized I didn't read the beginning of Anne of Green Gables. I don't know what's with me today. My head really just, thank God it's attached to my body. Okay, cause I, you know, I would lose it. This video is so all over the place. I apologize, but you know, keep keeping it real. <laughs> okay, chapter one. Mrs. Rachel Lynde is surprised. Mrs. Lynde lived just where the Avonlea main road dipped down into a little hollow fringed with alders and ladies' eardrops, and traversed by a brook that had its source away back in the woods of the old Cuthbert place. It was reputed to be an intricate, headlong brook in its earlier course through those woods, with dark secrets of pool and cascade, but by the time it reached Lynn's Hollow, it was a quiet, well-conducted little stream. For not even a brook could run past Mrs. Rachel Lynn's door without due regard for decency and decorum. It probably was conscious that Mrs. Rachel was sitting in her window, keeping a sharp eye on everything that passed, from Brooks and children up, and that if she noticed anything odd or out of place, she would never rest until she had ferreted out the whys and wherefores therefore. It starts out with Rachel Lind, who's quite a nosy neighbor, but you learn to love everyone in their own way, although Rachel Lind can be quite challenging at times. Anyway, that is Anne of Green Gables. Highly, highly, highly recommend, of course. Back to Don Quixote. Don Quixote is just the best. Just, it is absolutely worth your time. I love it so much. Please read it. I am going to read the beginning. Chapter 1. Concerning the famous Hidalgo, Don Quixote de la Mancha's position, character, and way of life. In the village of La Mancha, the name of which I cannot quite recall, there lived not long ago one of those countrymen or Hidalgos who keep a lance in a rack, an ancient leather shield, a scrawny hack, and a greyhound for coursing. So our main character of Don Quixote, it says on the back perfectly, Don Quixote has become so entranced by reading chivalry romances that he determines to become a knight errant himself. In the company of his faithful squire, Sancho Panza, his exploits blossom in all sorts of wonderful ways. While Quixote's fancy often leads him astray, he tilts at windmills, imagining them to be giants, Sancho acquires cunning and certain sagacity. Sane madman and wise fool, they roam the world together, and together they have haunted readers' imaginations for nearly 400 years. And what I love is how Don Quixote gets this idea to become a knight errant and he wants to be chivalrous and he wants to um, save maidens and fight uh, evil and but that is because of all these chivalry romances that he read so the aspect of reading is so prominent because reading books is what made him become this way and you're reading about it in its own book so it's like bookception it is amazing highly recommended love it so much it is just so good now finally, the last two books should be of no surprise, and that is because they are by my favorite author of all time, and that is Leo Tolstoy. So of course first we have War and Peace. War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy is absolutely 110 billion percent worth your time. Every single page is exquisite. Even when he rambles, it is exquisite. See, the thing with Victor Hugo is sometimes when Victor Hugo rambles, I don't love it. There's nothing happening in me besides, ugh, this is taking a while. And, you know, I get that, that thought in my head of, this is, it feels like it's taking a while when you're reading a long book that has a lot of rambly scenes. The second that Tolstoy starts rambling, I'm like, oh yes, amazing, I love it, fantastic. I don't know if that's just me or if you will feel the same way, but I love every sentence, punctuation mark, every line, every blank space in this book. I love every square inch of this story, as well as his incredible Anna Karenina, which is my favorite book of all time. Literally, will never shut up about this book. I have so many videos about Anna Karenina, and that is because this is, if you get any book out of this video, if you wanna read any book, read Anna Karenina. No book is worth your time more than Anna Karenina is. 
I love War and Peace. They both mean the absolute world to me. War and Peace was a life-changing reading experience. So was Anna Karenina. But Anna Karenina just holds such a special place in my heart. These characters feel like my part of my soul, part like dear, dearest, dearest friends. The writing is exquisite, the setting, the whole plot, the characters, everything. Everything about this book. I just, I can't say enough about it. Just, just read, read both of them, especially Anna Karenina. If you have never read Tolstoy before, I really recommend starting with Anna Karenina. I know it's quite hefty and intimidating, and it's a translated classic, and it, there are a lot of characters with a lot of names. Just read it. Just read it. You will be hooked from page one. So I will read you the first page, or the first paragraph, or first lines of War and Peace. As you can see from my excessive annotations, I love it very much. Ah, bringing back so many memories. It was in July 1805, and the speaker was the well-known Anna Pavlovna Scherer, maid of honor and favorite of the Empress Maria Fyodorovna. With these words, she greeted Prince Vasily, a man of high rank and importance, who was the first to arrive at her reception. Anna Pavlovna had had a cough for some days. She was, as she said, suffering from la grippe, or gripe, being then a new word in St. Petersburg, used only by the elite. All her invitations without reception, written in French and delivered by a scarlet livery footman that morning, ran as follows and then it is in French. And so, anyway, we, we start by being in this reception room, and we get introduced to all the characters, kind of like you are another person in this ballroom. And Tolstoy takes you by the hand and introduces you to many characters, and I think it's such a brilliant way to introduce you to a world, and to a group of people, and to a setting and a story. So I love it. It is absolutely worth your time. War and Peace can it, it can be done it can be done when i was thinking about reading it before i had read it i was thinking it's so daunting it's so intimidating it can be done one page at a time one step at a time and the adaptations are amazing i love the bbc adaptation but i know there are so many beautiful ones so that is war and peace then i will read you the beginning of anna karenina because it is brilliant my favorite beginning of any book ever because i just it's my favorite book. I will never shut up about it. All happy families are alike. Each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. All was confusion in the Oblonsky house. The wife had found out that the husband was having an affair with their former French governess, and had announced to the husband that she could not live in the same house with him. This situation had, had continued for three days now, and was painfully felt by the couple themselves, as well as by all the members of the family and household. They felt that there was no sense in their living together and that people who meet accidentally at any inn have more connection with each other than they, the members of the family and household of the Oblonskys. The wife would not leave her rooms, the husband was away for three days, the children were running all over the house as if lost. The English governess quarreled with the housekeeper and wrote a note to a friend asking her to find her a new place. The cook had already left the premises the day before, at dinner time. The kitchen maid and coachman had given notice. And so we start out with just this commotion and this upheaval and this adultery and infidelity and lack of faithfulness to his wife. And that introduces us to the whole entire story of Anna Karenina. My favorite character and the main character, I wouldn't say the main character is Anna Karenina, though she is the catalyst to all the events that happen in the, in the story, in the book. But I see the main character as being Konstantin Dmitrievich Levin, who will capture your heart and never give it back because he is just the best fictional character on the face of the earth. Um, and I love him so much, and I hope you will too. So absolutely worth your time. All of these books are amazing, which is why they're in this video. Thank you so much for watching this video. I feel like I have rambled on for so, so long, um, but I hope that it was enjoyable and that it inspired you to maybe pick up some of these books. They're my favorites for a reason. They are amazing. They are absolutely 110% worth every page, and I would love to know if you have read any of these, if you love them, um, what books do you think are absolutely worth 
my time. Um, if I haven't mentioned them, I would love to know, would love to get your recommendations. And I haven't read a really long classic in a while, and the more that I talk about my bigger books and my bigger classics, I really want to. So I would love your opinions. Anyway, um, I hope this was helpful. I hope you enjoyed. I hope you're having a fantastic day, and I will see you soon in another video. Happy reading.